Hello, it's Bruce T here with another podcast. I've entitled this podcast, One Touch from the King Changes Everything. I'm going to start by reading from Mark 5, 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed back over in the boat from the other side, a great multitude was gathered to him, and he was by the sea. Behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jarius by name, came and seeing him, he fell at his feet and begged him much, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healthy and live. He went with him. And a great multitude followed him, and they pressed upon him on all sides. The certain woman, who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things by many doctors, and had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse, having heard of things concerning Jesus, came up behind him in the crowd, and touched his clothes. For he said, If I touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately the flow of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power had gone from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the multitude pressing against you and you say, Who touched me? He looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had been done to her, came and fell before him and told him all the truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. When we think about the perfect world that God intended in the Garden of Eden and the fact that sin coming into the world had made such a difference to people. This is the misery of sin. The woman had been 12 years, spent all the money on doctors trying to cure the problem to no avail, and she still had a heavy blood loss. Now, in the Greek, the word for woman, gune, and it means a woman of any age. That's a virgin, a wife, or a widow. So we don't know how old this woman was, but we do know having a heavy blood loss meant there was quite a lot of restrictions on the woman. If we go to Leviticus 15, 25 to 26, we find if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not in the time of her period, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her period, all the days of the discharge of her uncleanliness shall be as if it was the days of her period. So she is unclean. Every bed she lies on, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as a bed of her period. Everything she sits on shall be unclean as the uncleanliness of her period. So that would have a lot of restrictions on the woman. God didn't create humans to be ailing, suffering creatures, but the restrictions on this woman were real and she'd suffered for 12 years. So many people thronged about Jesus, but curiously, only one came in to press behind him because she had a deep sense of need. She broke many of the protocols, but she had the faith to receive instant healing. But should she have touched Jesus? Did Jesus turn round and scold her for what she'd done for touching him? No, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. The Jewish prayer shawl, which we expect Jesus would have been wearing, had tassels around the corners. And we don't know if this is what the woman touched. It says in Numbers 15, 38 to 39, speak to the children of Israel and tell them that they should make themselves fringes on the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put on the fringe of each border a cord of blue. It shall be to you for a fringe that you may see it and remember all Yahweh's commandments. So for this woman, one touch of the king changed everything. She couldn't sneak off 
because Jesus knew power had gone out from him. The disciples thought it was strange that in all the madding crowd, Jesus felt one person touch him. Just imagine leaving a football ground. There's a lot of hustle and bustle and you're bound to get bumped along the way. But in this instance, just one touch from the king changed everything. Jesus was on the way to see Jairus' daughter, who's lying dead at his house. Was that it now for Jairus' daughter? Was Jesus sidetracked? She was definitely reported as being dead now. So we go back to the scripture in Mark 5. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue ruler's house saying, Your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? But Jesus, when he heard the message spoken, immediately said to the ruler of the synagogue, Don't be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. He came to the synagogue ruler's house and he saw an uproar, weeping and great wailing. When he had entered in, he said to them, Why do you make an uproar and weep? The child is not dead, but he is asleep. They ridiculed him. He, having put them all out, took the father of the child, her mother and those who were with him, and went in where the child was laying. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha, come I, which means being interpreted, girl, I tell you, get up. Immediately, the girl rose up and walked, for she was 12 years old. They were amazed, with great amazement. It strictly ordered them no one should know this, and commanded that something should be given her to eat. So no rank places a man beyond the reach of sorrow. Jarius probably had wealth, so all the medical help needed to be bought. But money couldn't buy. Death comes to all of us. If we read from Hebrews 9, 27 to 28, Inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this, judgment. But we should not be afraid of death. We need to believe Jesus, to take him at his word, as he says, He's built a mansion for us in heaven. John 14.2 says, In my father's house are many homes. If it weren't so, I would have told you, I am going to prepare a place for you. Jesus goes through the wailing crowd. He goes and sees the girl, and immediately she rose and got up. There was a change in the house. It went from weeping to rejoicing. Jesus can raise our children from death or trespass of sin to become children of God. We need to be persistent in our prayers. We also need to look forward to when there is no illness. This is called our blessed hope. And it's recorded in Titus 2.13. Looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we know that when God calls time on our life, we need, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are courageous, I say, and are willing rather to be absent from the body than to be at home with the Lord. Just like the thief on the cross who was next to Jesus, today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Lord, for our blessed hope. So we've talked about these two occurrences in the scripture presented with us today. And now, as we wrap this up, we find that Darius' daughter is dead. Yet one touch from the king brought her alive. So there was much rejoicing in that house. Jesus is still able to heal today. If we found ourselves ailing, injured or suffering, we need to pray. We need to ask God to heal us. He may want us to go through the medical professions. And if any incident is deemed necessary of emergency treatment, we need to get it. I believe it is right, sensible and imperative to want to get better. That must be our attitude. The advancement in medical science helps that. And if it cures that illness, then that's great. I found myself with sciatica, which resulted in a awful pain running down my leg. I prayed to God and was directed to a physiotherapist. You know, the guy you see running on the football pitch with a magic sponge. Yet the work of the physiotherapist 
is immense and I'm very thankful for all the care I have received. Much, much more than a magic sponge. I found this was beneficial and he also sent me for a scan where they found parts of the disc in my back were poking out and pressing on my sciatic nerve. So after all this information, they gave me a series of exercises to alleviate this problem and bit by bit, the sciatica pain reduced to nothing. When Jesus visited these people in our story, there were no scanners, no people running on with the magic sponge and the doctors weren't advanced as they are today. I believe prayer by yourself and the prayer of your colleagues, minister and the church is beneficial and effective. In fact, we are encouraged to seek prayer from the elders of the church. If you refer to James 5, 14, 6. In my experience, I don't know what worked the most, prayer, medical, or my determination to get better, but we never know what God did in, this, in these situations. In fact, it can all be summed up as being a mystery, as God often works behind the scenes, and we don't actually know what happened where. Did he get us to the right people at the right time? Did he enable us to want to get better? But I'm very thankful for the results in my cases. On the other hand, if it's a miracle that happens when all hope is lost or there is evidence before and after of a miraculous cure, then all the glory and praise can be given to God. Testimony is greatly received by believers and the ministry of healing is made real. So. We can't leave this podcast without praying for healing. Dear God, we love you and know of your love for us. Your power is supreme. Your wonder is beyond description. Your healing is complete. Your will is our desire. Today, we pray for your healing. You know it is my desire that my listeners be healed. Most importantly, we pray the prayer of Jesus, not my will but your will be done. Thank you that we can trust your will. We pray in the name of Jesus, the great physician. Amen. Remember, one touch from the king changes everything. So may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace, his love, his joy and his healing. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So until next time, bye for now.